the first Sunday after Christmas Day, Almighty God, who's given us thine only begotten Son, to take our nature upon him, and as at this time to be born of a pure virgin. Grant that we, being regenerate and made thy children by adoption and grace, may daily be renewed by the Holy Spirit, through the same our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the same Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. And now, on Christmas Day, we turn to Easter in verse 3 of 193. O Jesus, King of gentleness, do thou thyself our hearts possess, that we may give thee all our days the willing tribute of our praise. Well, we turn to Professor Louis Burkhoff. I think it's fair to say it was his systematic that I first read way back when I was 18 or 19. <laughs> that have read umpteen number of times since. And maybe may pick it back up and reread it as one last oorah. Um, it's a that systematic is just a measure. It's just compact. It's, it's immovable. It's like cement in the ground. It's just not going to move anywhere. So, uh, pro, a preface, prolegomena, subject matter, task of dogma, hit method and divisions of history of dogma, preparatory doctrinal development, apostolic fathers, perversions of the gospel, Reform movements in the church, the apologists, the beginning of church theology, anti nice Gnostic fathers, Alexandrian fathers, monarchianism, Trinitarian controversy, doctrine of Trinity and later theology, Christological controversies, anthropology in the patristic period, Pelagian and Arminian doctrines, anthropology of the Middle Ages, anthropology of the Reformation. What happened to theology proper? Doctrine of the Atonement before Anselm, from Anselm to the Reformation, in the Reformation, after the Reformation. <clears throat> the Doctrine of Application and Appropriation of Divine Grace, Soteriology, Patristic Period, Scholastic Period, Reformation, Soteriology, Church and Sacraments, and Doctrine of Last Things, Intermediate States, Second Advent, Millennial Hope, Resurrection, The Last Judgment. Preface, I'm going to have to enlarge this here, or I won't be able to read it too well. Preface, the historical volume was originally called Reform Dogmatics, now appears with a new title, the history of the Christian doctrines, works on the gradual development of theological truth in the Church of Jesus Christ usually appear alongside those which deal with the systematic reproduction of it and thus stand out as separate work, words. It was thought best to follow this practice since this will stress the fact that all the history of the development of Christian thought in the Church is a separate study. While it's a separate study, it is not one which the students of theology can afford to neglect. The study of doctrinal truth, apart from its historical background, leads to a truncated theology. Wish I had understood that more when I was younger. There have been too much of this in the past, and there's a great deal of it in the present day. There's no appreciation for the fact the Holy Spirit guided the truth and the interpretation and development of the truth as it was revealed in the Word of God. The checks and road signs of the past were not taken into consideration and ancient heresies long since condemned by the church are constantly repeated and represented as new discoveries. The lessons of the past are greatly neglected and many fields seem to feel they should strike out entirely on their own as if little has been accomplished in the past. Can anybody say Fred Schler Schleiermacher? Surely a theologian must take account of the present situation in the religious world and study it anew. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Louis Burkhoff, 1949. Prolegomena, the history of dogma is not concerned with theology in general. 
deals primarily with dogma, dogmas in the strict sense of the word and only secondarily with doctrines that have not yet received ecclesiastical sanction. The meaning of the word dogma is derived from the Greek dokain, which in the expression dokain moi meant it seems to me. It pleases me. I've definitely determined something so far that is established for me as a fact. The last meaning gradually predominated so that the word dogma became the designation of a firm, especially a public resolution or decree. It was applied to the self-evident truths of science to be established and admitted valid philosophic convictions as well as to government decrees and officially formulated tenets. The Bible uses the word as a designation, as a government decree in the Septuagint, Esther 3.9, Daniel 2.13, 6, 8, Luke 2, 1, Acts 17, 7 of the ordinance of the Old Testament, Ephesians 2, 15, Colossians 2, 14, and of the decisions of the assembly of Jerusalem. <coughs> well, it was the philosophical and not biblical usage of the term that gave rise to its later meaning in theology. Yet its use in 16, 4 has points of resemblance with its later usage in theology. The Jerusalem Assembly, it is true, did not formulate a doctrine, but a regulation for the ethical life of the church. While the word dogma is sometimes used in religion and theology with a great deal of latitude, is practically synonymous with doctrine, it generally has a more restricted meaning. A doctrine is the direct, often naive, expression of a religious truth it is not necessarily formulated with scientific precision and when it is may be merely the formulation of a single person a religious dogma on the other hand is a religious truth based on authority and officially formulated by some ecclesiastical assembly that this is the meaning of the word this meaning of the word is not determined by its scriptural use in which it always denotes a decree, a commandment, or a rule of practical life, but is in more harmony with the philosophical use of the word to denote a proposition or principle. Such of the early church fathers used to describe the substance of doctrine. You know, there's got another Hagen, Bach, History of Doctrines. I keep finding gems here and there. The origin and the character of dogmas, religious doctrines, are found in the scriptures thought not to form, to finish, not thought not in finished form, but dogmas in the current sense of the word are not found there. They are for a fruit of human reflection, the reflection of the church, often occasioned were intensified by theological controversies. Roman Catholics and Protestants differ somewhat in their description of the origin of dogmas. The former are minimized if they do not exclude the reflection of the church as the body of believers and substitute for it the study of the teaching church or hierarchy. Whenever a new form of error arises, the teaching church that is, the clericus, which now has its infallible spokesman in the Pope, after careful examination, formulates the doctrine taught in Scripture or by tradition, declares it to be a revealed truth, and imposes its acceptance on the faithful. Says Wilmers in his Handbook of Christian Religion, a dogma, therefore, is a truth revealed by the Spirit and at the same time proposed for our belief. Sparago Clark in the Catechism explained, a truth which the church puts forward before us is revealed truth is called the truth of a dogma. The reformers substituted for this Roman Catholic view, another which in spite of its similarity yet differs from it in important points. 
According to them, all religious dogmas derived from their material content, scripture, and scriptures only. They do not recognize the unwritten word or tradition as the source of dogmas. <clears throat> At the same time, they do not regard dogmas as statements taken directly from the Bible, but represent them as the fruit of the reflection of the church as a body of believers on the truths of revelation. Since the reflection of the church is often determined and deepened by doctrinal controversies, the formulations to which the church councils or synods are finally led under the guidance of the Holy Spirit often bear the earmarks of past struggles. They are not infallible, but yet I have a high degree of stability. They are authoritative, not merely because they are proposed by the church, but formally as defined by the church and materially as based on the word of God. Under the influence of Schleiermacher ritual, I just don't know if I could bear reading ritual. S, just a second, R I T. S-C-H-L, and others, a radically different conception of the origin of dogmas was developed, which found ready acceptance in many Protestant circles. It represents the Christian consciousness, Christian experience, the Christian faith, or the Christian life is the source of the material. So it's very Schleiermachian. Christian consciousness, Christian experience, Christian faith. Sounds like the modern Pentecostals. The dogmas of the church are simply the intellectual formations of its experience, sentiments, and belief, which according to some are awakened by an objective factor in which piety recognizes a divine revelation. Schleiermacher contends for the immediacy of these experiences while ritual and his school maintain that they are mediated by some objective factor which honors God as a revelation of God. The religious community reflects on these experiences and finally by some competent body gives them formal intellectual expression and thus transforms them into dogma. On this view, as on the other, the formulation of dogmas is not the work of an individual theologian but of a community either the church for Schleiermacher or the state going hand in hand with the church, Lobstein. This view of the origin of dogmas is held by Schleiermacher, Ritchell, Kaufton, Lobstein, Vinette, Sabatier, Von Dijk, and others. It should be noted, however, that it does not describe the way in which the dogmas actually originated in the Protestant churches but only the way in which, according to these writers, dogmatics should come into existence. They regard the old dogmas as antiquated because they are too intellectual and do not give adequate expression to the life of the church and call for a new dogma vibrant with the life of religious community. Uh, von Harnack view describes describes, deserves special mention here. In his monumental work, The History of Dogma, he seeks to describe the whole dogma of the early church by representing it as an unnatural mix of Greek philosophy and Christian faith, in which he says foreign philosophical ingredient is the preponderating element. Says he, dogma in its conception development is the work of the Greek spirit on the soil of the gospel. The church yielded to the temptation to represent its message in a form that would make it appear as wisdom rather than the foolishness and thus gain for it the proper respect for educated people. That seems to be a problem like even in the Alexandrian church. Even, in, even today, to be respectable, be listened to, you have to have a few doctorates. 
practical faith of the church was transformed into an intellectual concept, a dogma, and this became the real pivot of the history of the church. This was a great mistake and a mistake that was continued in later formation of dogmas so that the whole history of dogmas is really the history of colossal error. It is the great ambition of the richly in school to which Harnack belongs to eliminate all metaphysics from theology. The dogma may be defined as a doctrine derived from scripture, officially denied by the church, defined by the church, I'm sorry, and declared to rest upon divine authority. This definition partly names and partly suggests its characteristics. Its subject matter is derived from the word of God and is therefore authoritative. It's not a mere repetition of what is found in scripture, but the fruit of dogmatic reflection. And it is officially defined by a competent ecclesiastical body and declared to rest upon divine authority. It has social significance because it is the expression not of a single individual, but of a community. And it has traditional value since it passes the precious possessions of the church on to the future generations. In the history of dogma, we see the church becoming ever increasingly conscious of the riches of the divine truth under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, mindful of her high prerogative as pillar and ground of the truth. The task of the history of dogma. The task of the history of dogma is briefly stated to describe the historical origin of the dogma of the church and to trace its subsequent changes and developments, or in the words of Seberg, I've been looking at him for a while now. That's to show how the dogma as a whole and the separate, and I think WHGT has something on dogma. Well, he's a dogmatic theology, volumes one and two, but that's uh, more of a systematics. He's using the term in an older sense. It's prerepositions, presuppositions. The great presupposition of the history of dogma would seem to be that the dogma of the church is changeable and has, in fact, as a matter of fact, undergone many changes in the course of its historical de development. That which is unchangeable is not subject to development and has no history. Protestant theology has always maintained the position that the dogma of the church, while characterized by a high degree of stability, is yet subject to change and has in the course of history been enriched by new elements. <clears throat> Received more careful formulation It has no difficulty, therefore, with the idea of a history of dogma. The situation is somewhat different, however, in Roman Catholic theology. Roman Catholics glory in the fact that they have an unchangeable dogma and feel far superior to the Protestant who, in the words of Cardinal Gibbons, appeals to the unchanging Bible in support of his ever-changing doctrines. He says that the creed of the church is now identical with what it was in past ages, faith of our fathers. Winters speaks in a similar vein when he says the Christian religion is unchangeable in all its revealed doctrines. In all those precepts and institutions which are intended for all men, no article of faith for of a doctrine there is mainly question can be added or subtracted. Nor can any dogma receive a different meaning from that given by Christ, handbook of Christian religion. We are told repeatedly by Roman Catholic authors that the church cannot make new dogmas, but can only hand down the sacred deposit that was entrusted to her. 
But if the repeated assertions that the church cannot make new dogmas is true, then it follows that the dogmas were already given in the original deposit in the faith once delivered to the saints and contained in scripture and the apostolic tradition. No dogma was ever added to the sacred deposit and no dogma contained in it was ever changed. The church only has power to declare a truth to be revealed by God and to give it an infallible interpretation. The dogma then does not develop and therefore has no history. This determines the Roman Catholic conception of the history of dogma. Says B.J. Otten, the Roman Catholic author. Just a second, B.J. Otten. Manual of the history of dogmas. He's a Roman Catholic. It presupposes that revealed truths are objectively permanent and immutable, and also that their subjective apprehension and outward expression admits of progress. For a t long time, Roman Catholics looked the scant at the history of dogma. Neander says that a modern theologian, Hermas of Bonn, has asserted that to treat the history of dogmas as a special branch of study on account of the change in development which it presupposes militates against the Catholic Church. For that reason, he has scrupled to give lectures upon it, the histories of Christian dogmas. Batavius was the first of the Roman Catholics to suggest something like a doctrine of development. Later on, Moeller, and especially Newman, advocated a theory of development, which met with, consider with, met with, met with considerable, though not universal, favor. The latter's theory is to the effect that many of the doctrines of the church were only germinally present in the original deposit. They were seeds implanted in the mind of the church that were pregnant with suspected possibilities and in course of time unfolded into full-blown doctrines. While opposition often arose to the new doctrinal expressions, they gradually gained ground and increased in popularity. Finally, the teaching of the church, the hierarchy, stepped in to test the results of the new development and to set the stamp of its infallible approval on them. The second presupposition of a history of dogma is that development of the dogma of the church moved along organic lines. It was therefore in the main a continuous growth, in spite of the fact that the leaders of the church and their endeavors to apprehend the truth often wandered into blind alleys, changing will-o'-the-wisps and toying with different elements. If the church in the past had proceeded on the assumption now advocated by many that the changing conditions of the religious life ever and anew call for a new dogma, that every age must formulate its own dogma, discarding the old and substituting for it another more in harmony with the spiritual conditions of the times, it would have been quite impossible to write a history of dogma in the organic sense of the word. We shall have to proceed on the assumption of the church, despite the melancholy aberrations which characterized her search for truth and often led her into ways of error. Yet gradually advanced in her apprehension and formulation of the truth, we shall have to assume that even such a tremendous religious upheaval of the Re as a reformation did not constitute a complete break with the doctrinal development of the past. While many errors were exposed and corrected, the reformers sought support for their views in the early church fathers and did not even hesitate to adopt some views which were developed in the Middle Ages. There was continuity of thought, even here. Its subject matter, the fact that the history of dogma deals primarily with the dogmas of the church 
and does not mean that it need not concern itself with those doctrinal developments. It would be a mistake to assume that it cannot begin with the Council of Nicaea and end with the adoption of the last of the historical confessions. In order to describe the genesis of the earliest dogmas of the church, it must take as its starting point at the close of the period of special revelation in the study of the apostolic fathers. We'll have to take account of those performations of the dogmas of the church that have resulted from theological discussions of the day and met with rather general approval, though they did not receive the official stamp of the church, those peripheral truths that necessarily followed from the central and controlling dogma, <clears throat> yet did not receive special ecclesiastical sanction. From this it follows that as far as external history is concerned, the history of dogma cannot neglect the study of the great doctrinal controversies of the church, which were the birth pangs of new dogmas and often had a determining influence on their formulation. Though this study may not always be edifying, it is absolutely essential to the proper understanding of the genesis of ecclesiastical dogmas. In these controversies, differences of opinion became apparent and in some cases gave rise to different lines of development and doctrinal formulations arose which were at variance with the united consciousness of the church in general. Even these departures from the main line of thought are important for the history of dogma since they have often led to clearer and sharper formulations of the truth. But while the history of dogma cannot afford to ignore any of the external facts that bear on the development of dogma, it should never lose sight of the fact that it is primarily concerned with the development of theological thought in the consciousness of the church and should therefore trace the development of the idea which is inherent in the revealed religion of God itself. Hegel and Bauer rendered good service to the history of dogma when they directed attention to the fact that the development of dogma is controlled by an inner law, though their principle of interpretation does not commend itself to Christian thought. We can discern a certain logical necessity in the successive stages of the development of each dogma and in the order in which the various dogmatic problems presented themselves. In general, it may be said that the logical order usually followed in the study of dogmatics is reflected more or less in the history of dogma. And it's here that we'll call it. Verse 3 of our Easter hymn 193. Verse 4, I'm sorry. O Lord of all, with us abide in this our joyful Easter tide. From every weapon death can wield, thine own redeemed, forever shield. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. And Godspeed.